All right, today we're going to talk about the energy equation and pretty much instantly we're going to go from the energy equation to the Bernoulli equation. Um, well, instantly isn't, isn't really the right word. It actually takes a lot of work. So this video is going to be um, a derivation. So if you just want to work problems, skip to the next one. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is what we did with all the other Reynolds transport theorem type um, derivations. So we have this beta value once again, and this time the beta value is going to be total energy. Okay, so that kind of presents a little bit of a problem because there are many different sources you could have for energies. Uh, the ones that we're going to concern ourselves with are internal energy, kinetic energy, uh, potential energy in the form of gravitational potential energy, and just for sake of completeness we have this term over here called E sub other. So the other kinds of energies you can have are, um, if you remember from general physics, you can have elastic potential energy that you find in springs. Um, if you remember electromagnetism, you could have a columbic energy associated with charges, but we're pretty much going to deal with these guys over here. So this will essentially encompass the microscopic energies um, that you see at a molecular level, those sorts of interactions. And over here, these deal with the bulk of the material at a macroscopic level. So the kinetic energy as far as how it's moving, usually linear, um, and the potential energy will again just be for gravitational potential energy. Okay, so that said, oh, okay, so I should put this up. Um, okay, so the way we're going to write the internal energy is going to be m times u and u is going to be a unit sort of like a uh, specific well specific heat or in this case it's going to be specific energy because it's going to be some sort of energy per unit mass and we're going to multiply that by m to get just energy uh, similarly the other two guys you've already seen before in your general physics the kinetic term will just be that half mv squared that shows up over and over again and the potential energy from gravity is just going to be mgh. Um, okay, and with that defined, we can now write our Reynolds transport theorem. Okay, and it's going to look something like this. So remember, this beta over here um, comes over here. So it's the, the energy, so dE dt. And then what goes in the control volume of the control surface is beta divided by m. So you need to take each of these terms and divide them by m. So that's where you get u, that's where you get half v squared, and that's where you get gh. Now, if you've picked up on it, I've already made one simplifying assumption. And you'll see that there's very, very many simplifying assumptions that we'll need to make to get to the Bernoulli equation. The first one that I've made here is steady state. And if you remember from previous videos, what that does is it makes the control volume integral that we had before uh, go to zero because there's a time derivative in that expression. Um, and when that time derivative goes to zero, you lose the control volume term. So that's the first simplifying assumption we're going to make. Okay, the next is something that hopefully you'll remember from your thermodynamics class if you've taken that yet. And that is this. So the change occurs from here to here. And this says that the total energy of the system uh, can be written as, well, E equals Q minus W. Where if you remember, E is the energy of the system, Q is thermal energy, or remember, thermal energy is really just the, the transfer energy due to heat, and then you have this W over here that stands for work. So it's the energy usually gained through heat transfer and lost by the system doing work. So this comes from the first, okay, so I'll put laws in blue and I'll put uh, simplifying assumptions in red. So this is the first law of thermodynamics. I'm not going to review that so much here. Um, but you could, you know, either Google it or look it up in a textbook, and you'll learn a lot more than you'll, you'll learn from me. Just take my word that the total energy of the system can be written as Q minus W. Okay, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to immediately, uh, 
pretty much backpedal on that and say, okay, how about this? So the difference from this step to this step is that we've lost this dq dt. And the assumption we make here is that the system is adiabatic. What does adiabatic mean? It means no loss to heat. No loss to heat, not do heat. That means there's the, the pipe that we're eventually going to be looking at is basically perfectly insulated, which means no energy enters the system through heat transfer and no energy is lost from the system through heat transfer. And what that does, it just eliminates this heat term over here, or this thermal, thermal energy term. Okay, then what happens? Okay, so if you remember from general physics, or perhaps even from the last video, if you have your dW dt, or your change in work per time, what that really is, is power. And I'll denote this time derivative with uh, the dot notation. So this w dot just stands for dW dt. And just like energy can be broken up into many different terms, uh, your, your work could be broken up into many different terms. So that's what we have here. I'm about to explain what each of these means. So W sub S is called shaft work. Um, and shaft work is basically if you have any cranks, levers, pulleys, etc. in your system, then you have some sort of well, what we call mechanical transfer of energy in the system. So mechanical energy. Okay, what about, so I'll draw an arrow from this to this. Okay, what about this W sub P? Okay, well this you're already a little bit familiar with. This is um, pressure work. So work due to pressures on the system. So if you have something exerting a force on the system over an area, uh, that's gonna, well, that's gonna generate some energy. So that's all that's sitting there, and you should be somewhat familiar with this one. This one over here is a little bit um, foreign, probably. This is called viscous work, and this is drag due to viscous forces. So if you're working with a fluid that isn't uh, well, well behaved, let's say. So if you're using water, that's not so bad. But if you're using, say, molasses or something, um, as that molasses flows through the pipes of the system, you're going to get what's, what's called a lot of viscous drag. So the fluid doesn't really want to move throughout the system. And those are similar to frictional forces, as in the, the fluid itself is exerting forces on the pipe that make it want to slow down. Okay. So again, cool, we, we introduced these terms, and then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to assume that they, uh, they don't exist in our system. So what that does, it simplifies things to this. So the assumptions we make here are no shaft work, so no mechanical parts in the system. And by mechanical parts, I mean like moving cranks and, and levers and stuff like that. The other assumption we're making is uh, inviscid flow. So our flow does not have effects due to viscosity. So this kills this term and this term. So this guy's gone, this guy's gone. The only thing we're left with is our power of pressure or a change in work per time due to pressure. Okay, so how can we describe this, this term here? Well, if we we're going to write this as some sort of integral, it would look like this. Let me get rid of this vector notation. So it's the magnitude of this pressure um, times the dot product integrated over the area. And the way you could tell this makes sense is if we use our typical assumptions, this is going to equal pressure times velocity times area. Or rearranged, you're really looking at pressure times area times velocity. 
And if you group the pressure and the area together, you're really looking at force times velocity, which we know is really what? Well, it's the same time thing as work per time. It has the same units. Here we have newtons times meters per second. If you're looking at work, that's really looking at force times distance over time. So this is power, which is P. Same thing as work per time. So let's substitute that into our equation. Now the reason I was being a little bit careful about that vector notation is in the past um, few derivations when we were looking at linear momentum conservation and angular momentum conservation, I always ask the question, is the transport law we're looking at a scalar equation or a vector equation? And for mass conservation it was scalar. For uh, linear momentum it was vector and for angular momentum it was also a vector equation but here um, you'll you'll start to see maybe you could even see it from the the beginning um, this is a scalar this is a scalar times a scalar so this is all still a scalar over here energy is a scalar and if you look at these three terms they turn out to be scalars so the energy equation is actually going to end up to be a scalar equation and well You'll find out later when we start doing problems that scalar equations are a little bit easier to deal with because you don't have to worry about, um, well, it sounds obvious, but vectors. So if we move, the, the change from here is that we moved this term over to the other side, and then you realize, okay, you're integrating over the same control surface. So you really have this term plus this term all in the same integral of this control surface. Okay. If we go a step further and define our problem to be some sort of pipe problem, then you'll remember that we have an inlet and we have an outlet. So what that gets us is two control surfaces. And if we assume that the inlets and the outlets are well behaved, and what I mean by that is if you have your velocity flowing through like this, your normal vectors will be collinear like this then we can make even more simplifying assumptions. We know that we'll get two terms, an inlet term and an outlet term. And they are actually going to look like this when you integrate things. Now remember, what I just said was we had these few assumptions that we've been making almost every single video. And that's that, well the first thing is that velocity profile is constant that lets you pull up over here uh, this velocity out of the integral. The other thing is that V and N are collinear. That prevents us from getting any sines or cosines that would come out of this dot product. For the inlets you're simply going to get minus the magnitude of the velocity. That, that's what you see over here. Well, one of them is on the left side of the equation, one of them is on the right side of the equation, so that's where you have that negative sign coming out. Um, so you're, you're only ever going to get minus the velocity or plus the velocity when you're doing the dot product. And the other thing is that it's incompressible. What that means is that you can bring this row out of the integral and then at the end of the day you're just going to be integrating over dA and you're going to get the areas. So all the terms over here are, they have the subscript in and all the terms over here have the subscript out. Now you'll, you'll start to notice one thing is that if we're assuming it's incompressible, then the density at the beginning will be the same thing as the density at the end. So these are okay to cancel out. Uh, the other thing I should point out is that um, when combining these two parts together, we've written it as P divided by rho so that you could distribute this rho out here. And that's how I eventually got that cancellation. So if the P over rho is confusing you, um, just go back up here and work out the algebra slowly until you get down to here. I realize that's quite a few steps at once. Okay, and then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to use our good old friend, the continuity equation. So remember, volumetric flow is going to be conserved. So V in A in will be the same thing as V out A out. So V in A in is over here, and V out A out is over here. So we're able to get rid of these two guys over here. That gets you is this. 
I'll make a node in here that we used continuity equation and that gets us here but wait there's more we're not we're not quite done yet though we're getting pretty close the one more assumption you can make is that the system is isothermal and I'll explain that in a sec so here we're going from the last step this one assuming it's isothermal and what you'll notice is that these internal energy terms have dropped out so what isothermal means is that when the flow enters it's at a certain temperature and when the flow exits it's at that same temperature now if you have a very simple function describing your internal energy you'll say that oh all the molecular energies are dependent on temperature like if you had an ideal gas and because the temperature at the beginning of the, the pipe flow is the same as the temperature at the end of the pipe flow your internal energy at the inlet is essentially the same as your internal energy at the outlet and that lets you cancel those two out so the last thing is that usually people put the Bernoulli equation in this form so all I've done here is I've rearranged the, the order uh, to put this pressure guy out in front this kinetic energy term uh, in the center and what used to be this gravitational potential energy term on the right so this is the form most people call their Bernoulli equation okay okay so one thing you should note immediately is what are the units here remember the units need to be dimensionally homogeneous well if this is a height over here and then units here are going to be in meters and if you go through each of these terms you'll figure out yeah everything is in meters um, which is a little bit strange so when you introduce what people call corrections uh, to the Bernoulli equation those also come with the unit of meters so here we have a friction term a turbine term and a pump term and the unit in all of these are going to be meters the easiest way to figure out how these guys work is to start diving into problems, but I'll describe them a little bit here. So basically you're saying that energy is conserved between the inlet and the outlet, except we're going to try to quantify some of the losses with these terms here, rather than do something more complicated. So each of these are what are called head loss terms. And they, well, okay, in the case of the friction, you're saying I'm losing energy from this guy and with a turbine the idea is that you're using the inlet flow stream to power that turbine and you're losing energy to the turbine so you're also going to have a negative sign over here with a pump usually does is it actually adds energy to your flow to actually get it uphill so that's where this again this idea of everything's going to have the dimensions of meters so your your head loss from your pump will actually be positive as in it's supplying um, more energy to go for the flow to go upward because that's usually what a pump does um, again it'll become a bit more apparent when we start doing problems but just look at look at how many assumptions we need to make to get here we had to assume it was steady state adiabatic there was no shaft work inviscid flow we had to assume that the velocity profile was constant VN the, the normal vector are collinear, the system was incompressible, the system was isothermal, and then finally we got to the Bernoulli equation. So I guess what I'm trying to say is be very careful when you use the Bernoulli equation because you need to make sure all of these assumptions are valid before you use it. Okay, next time we're going to work on some problems and I hope that helped.